Hello everyone and welcome back to The Grim Reader. This is my weekly reading update for the previous week and this is going to be the 20th episode of The Grim Chronicles. Um, so I haven't really been able to get into the uh, reading groove yet in terms of being able to really read as much as I would like just because of external busyness and um, I also am going to be getting new glasses with a slightly stronger prescription so that was part of my issues with reading perhaps and uh, so it means that I've just finished the one book that I'll get into but I just wanted to point out a few things so on Tuesday I was able to go to school go to the building a, a specific building so our, uh, our university has a humanities center who that does sort of year-long programs and the program coming up for this year is I think it's race and some other word race and mobility perhaps and the speaker for one of the lectures is going to be Isabel Wilkerson and is that's why we're we're being given the opportunity to, to read this book and perhaps there'll be a discussion of it aside from the lecture with her but I decided to get a copy of it because I know a lot of people in booktube have really enjoyed it and i wanted to take this wonderful opportunity that my university gave us of getting the copy and read it so i will do that as you get got as people may know i don't have a good track record with nonfiction, which does remind me i need to update people a few weeks ago because of the covid effects uh, side effects i had picked up uh patrick madden keefe's the Empire of Pain uh, about the Sackler dynasty and the opioid crisis, OxyContin. And I haven't made much progress in it. I'm still in two minds as to whether I'm putting it aside or DNFing it. I DNFed his other book about the Troubles, which I also thought was good, but it just, I don't know what it is with these journalistic non-fictions. I've said it before, they have a hard time holding me, so hopefully I'll do better with Cass. But n since I know she's coming and giving a talk, I ho hopefully I will. And I'm not sure about Empire of Pain. We'll have to see what I do with that one. Maybe I'll come back to it, maybe not. I mean, it's on my, it's on my iPad, so, you know, it's there waiting for me. And then uh, also the other one I didn't get enough to, basically not at all, was Anna Karenina. And I'm still kind of not sure if I'll put it aside. This is, I had this, I uh, thought that it's a little bit, I never thought of myself as a seasonal reader. But for some reason, this one is, has a kind of winter, maybe because it's Russia, <laughs> probably. The, I want to read this in the in the fall or in the winter as opposed to the summer, but that's just silly. I don't know. I'll have to see. I'm not quite sure. I might give myself a break. Um, I'm not sure. One thing that's going on is that we have to pack up all our books because we're getting new flooring throughout the whole house, which is a big undertaking, and it does involve packing all of our books. Every book on every shelf has to be put into a box, put into the garage and then put back and so it's led it's leading to a major culling well I am sort of putting I put have two piles to give away to keep and um, it's also been really busy just getting th that ready and I have sort of fatigue from doing stuff already and I also have anticipatory fatigue because of what I know what's coming in terms of getting the house ready and then also the anxiety of what to do with the cats but it will all get done and it will look lovely and everything will be fine not to worry uh, so let's see so the one book that i finished that i want to spend most of my time talking about today is the good soldier by ford maddox ford this is part of the 1900 to 1950 readathon and the modernism readathon and it was really interesting but i actually don't think i liked it very much <laughs> to be honest it was published in 1915 and I was mulling over whether I would like, so in the begin. I have to say, I do think I liked it in the beginning, the first sections, early, earlier parts, when it was still sort of fresh and quiet. The prose is interesting. I mean, he is, he's, he's a good writer, you know, at the uh, sentence, sentence by sentence, he's a, he is a good writer. And, you know, he's, Ford Maddox Ford has a very, had a very colorful, and interesting life that some of the stuff in the novel itself kind of parallels 
and he was deeply immersed in the literary culture of his time. He, he was an editor of literary journals in England, um, and he, it says here, he was connected to three circles, modernist circles. So he was neighbors with Henry James and I think Joseph Conrad. And, um, sorry, I'm trying to figure out where, yeah, yeah, James, Con J Henry James, Joseph Conrad, Stephen Crane, and Wells. And then also on um, more avant-garde people, Dorothy Richardson, I'm not that familiar, Rebecca West, I think, Pound, Lewis, Lawrence. Does, does that mean T.H. Lawrence? And then also Joyce, Hemingway, Jean Rees, and Gertrude Stein. Um, and so the and so you know he's he, he's obviously well established, but I don't think this holds up at least to my in my personal opinion. I did not like this as much. I mean, I remember really really enjoying Henry the Henry James that I read. Granted, it was many years ago, but I'm pretty sure I would um, like Henry James better. I always see Henry James. I don't know where I get this from as a kind of the. A, 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 the continuing line from someone like George Eliot, so psycholog psychological, but in a different way than this was. And um, so this focuses on two couples and the narrator kind of describing the characters of the other three, but it's, um, for lack of a better term, it's shtick is that he, he doubts everything about, about his own narration. Um, on one page here, I think um, uh, it says here something about how doubting, d doubt is at the light motif of this work. So I found it says here uh, on, on uh, in the early part of the introduction, D doubt is a light motif of the good soldier. Dowell, the the main narrator, whose sort of textbook unreliable. Dell is continually abstaining from judgment, lamenting that, quote, it is all a darkness, asking, quote, for who in this world can give anyone a character? Who in this world knows anything of any other heart or, his, or of his own? And telling us, I don't know. Um, and so for me, it's sort of like, to hang your novel on that, on, on this idea that him always saying things like, who knows the truth? It just became kind of annoying. Um, and that's not to say that I don't like unreliability in my narrators, but I think I just have to like the narrator more. Uh, I, on the one hand, I do think that there is something to be said for someone who sort of carries you through the novel, like Trollope or even George Eliot, you know, very kind of, they're kind, they're kind of there and they're holding your hand through the narration. Uh, and then you can be manipulated by that too. And this is sort of someone in the story who is also a character in the story, sort of not doing that. And it just got kind of um, boring to a certain extent, the whole, the, because it was sort of too repetitive in this. And so so basically what happens with the four characters is that he tells the story of their of their relationship and they're coming together, meeting meeting each other. And then he sort of, not a little bit before midway, switches it all up and, and it turns into a story of all their infidelities and their you know, affairs. Specifically, the other ma male of the foursome has a lot of affairs. And he sort of, so he starts out as, the narrator starts out as thinking, what is it with this guy? Why does everyone seem to love him? He seems so shallow to me. I mean, I'm, you know, rephrasing things but then it's sort of as it goes on it's sort of he and, and everyone else falls under the spell of this person and he turns into this very magnanimous and charming person apparently so we start out with a more negative assessment of him and then it and even even at some at the end even the narrator says that he was sort of in love with this person and and it's weird because we, we, we it's as if as they all fall in love with him, we see him having affairs and being an you know being an idiot with his money. So we fall out of love as uh, at the same time that everyone in the novel is falling in love with him, which is actually kind of interesting. But it didn't really the actual reading of the book wasn't that satisfying for me, even though he's a he's an ad, he's a a good writer, but the the telling of the story just seems sort of why am I I mean I hate to sort of this cliche of why am I supposed to care about these people. And for me, an issue was how 
uh, classist it was. I'm not sure. I, I, I don't mind reading about the upper classes. I mean, Edith Wharton has a sort of the same issue, but with her, at least the characters are more interesting and you kind of feel for their plights more with these people who seem to have, a, to, to have money th kind of flow in very vague terms given to them and inheritance and, and they seem to get no joy out of this money and it doesn't, they don't seem to do any work for it which is a sign of the times. I mean, it really is the sort of the, the, the height of the beginning of Downton Abbey, you know, and I guess that maybe there's a sense of it, it's going to change, but, but still, these are just very, very privileged people leading kind of bored lives. And so with other modernist novels, I mean, even though I didn't get very far with Proust, I did like it better in a certain sense, although maybe there was something similar that made me stop reading. <laughs> you kind of just get like sick of it all. Uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. And uh, one thing I found here on page uh, uh, 11 of the introduction, Max Saunders' introduction, and that kind of kind of gives me an insight as to what my issue was. Uh, it says here, talking about stream of consciousness, which I do like. You know, I'm I'm you know the more experimental, often the better for me. It says here something like, what does he say here? Well, Ford has written, and it's also in this edition, a, an essay on Impressionism, which I don't want to read because I'm just bored with Ford. <laughs> bored with Ford. <laughs> but um, Impressionism is sometimes described in ways that make it sound like a mere refinement of realism, moving realism from its fascination with the detail of the material world closer to the interior world of individual consciousness, which I'm all for that. I kind of like the combination of both. Perception thought and feeling, and thus a step on the road to the modernist stream of consciousness novel. And here we get something about this novel, but the good soldier's narration, modeled on speaking rather than thinking, can all too often be made to seem essentially realist, realist, etc. So this, and it's true that he's, the, st the frame of the narration is that he's sitting there envisioning an ideal listener, listening to him blab, basically, <laughs> talk. And, you know, this is not, the frame that we have in Wuthering Heights or where you just kind of get immersed in the story and you forget about it. it this is him really just talking to, to, to no one, to us. And this emphasis on talking versus stream of consciousness or thinking, I think that might be why I just didn't care for this as much. Uh, we don't really, I just didn't care about these people and I didn't become invested in any of them and I didn't really care and the going back and forth between is is the one woman so the his wife the narrator's wife turns into this very negative character who just has affairs which you know is that's not I'm not, I'm not being moralistic about that it's just she turned into she was described as, the, as this overly ethereal not well woman and then and then it turns out she's just an awful person who i don't even know why she got married to the narrator maybe because he had money i can't even remember why she married him she didn't love him <laughs> and she carried on this affair that she was having with this person oh i think maybe that's why she married this guy sort of to give it's an affront for her her what she really wanted to do so sort of manipulative in that sense and you know it's just the reading was not joyous. I did not enjoy this book. Um, I thought I did in the beginning and I think I did enjoy the first parts where, there, where the group was in Germany um, in, at the spa um, but then I didn't and so yeah I'm sorry this is all kind of sad and negative but it just didn't work for me and I don't know, it, is, it has put me off, you know, apparently he wrote 30 novels. And I'm like, wow, am I never going to read another Ford? You guys tell me if I should, if I should try something. What I really want to do, and I have a copy of Portrait of, of a Lady, so I have a James there. And what I really want to do is read sort of more sort of typically modernist fare, like go back and read some Wolf novels, Virginia Woolf, for example. Moving, moving away from... I mean, for he, he, it was just very sort of a male perspective, a classist perspective, white male privilege, dripping with privilege. And I'm kind of, even, I, even though I have a very high tolerance, fairly high tolerance for all that stuff, you know, I read the recognitions and enjoyed it. I'm kind of a little bit up to here with it. And so I've moved away from that. And I think I've given up on the, on the modernism read-along read for this 
this time around, I'll come back to the 1900s to the 1950s, but, but right now I'm in the mood for something completely different. And so I have a couple of options, one that I've already started, and I think I'm going to like it, because for one thing it is so different, and it's the novel Luster by Raven Leilani, so young uh, African-American black narrator, female, and I really like the beginning. I started watching two of my favorite booktubers, younger booktubers, so Alex, what page are you on, and Claire, and I think they both, I haven't, I, did, I stopped watching, I just wanted to see if they liked it, and they, they both liked the novel, <laughs> and that's enough for me, and I actually really like it, and I was reading some of the reviews, and you can just tell that they're sort of Mm, the fact that she makes bad choices or that she basically sleeps with a lot of men in the beginning and in her office but it's which you know but the way it's described is actually quite humorous and it's very perceptive like hard-hitting like well sort of I mean she's she implicates herself too you know she she's good like her her, her view of the world is is one that I'm kind of like getting or or I'm enjoying at least and it's she's gonna have issues and troubles I know that uh but but so far, so good, and I think I'm going to enjoy it. Just something completely different. So yeah, a sort of a, a millennial novel. And then um, the, the other one is another completely different book, but I found it on the shelves when I was cleaning. And it kind of, kind of goes back to the, the whole thing about uh, pain and joy and how I always go for pain, which is true. But I found a cozy read, and this is a cat, a cat book, a cat mystery. And so this goes back to, brings us, be, reminds me of a time in our lives when we would go for holidays in Michigan because we lived in Michigan anyway. We would drive around Michigan, so specifically going to the northern part, not UP necessarily, but just the northern part. But other drives that we took, we would listen to these novels on audio on in the car, and they were just so delightful. They're very light weight, but they're fairly well written, and there's enough there to be it for, to be amusing. And 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 what's amusing for cat lovers is the other two cats. So he has uh, Quillerang is our prize winning reporter who with a nose for crime, and he starts off in Detroit and ends up in this northern Michigan town, fictional town, which is a little bit too, you know, it's funny though. It's quite well done. And then so he has two cats: Coco, a Siamese cat with extraordinary talents and a flair for mystery. These cats are too good to be true. And then Yum Yum, a lovable. A lovable Siamese adored by her two male companions and so Coco's the male cat and I just love how close he is to to Quilleran they're like they're like partners in crime or partners in solving crime and as I recall there's this funny thing where the book there's always a book that falls out from the shelf and Coco or Coco kicks it pushes a book out and then and he has to read that book or oh, there's some clues to something going on that's, that's one thing I recall so I might just dip into this as a nice completely um, deep but enjoyable read. Oh, and I remember what, how I decided I would want to read this. I did the 112 page thing and I have to show you, re read out what it says here, which just sold me the book. So, you know, the, the challenges where you read a page 112. And so I opened it to page 112 and it says here, so he's been walking in the woods. Oh yeah, there's a sentence about Coco, his cat companion. Um, and now it was sending him signals. Coco, with his twitching whiskers and inquisitive nose, had the same propensity in a way they were brothers under the skin. And this is after he'd been um, walking in the woods, uh, and it says that. Uh, and then it says, Quilleran spent the rest of the evening reading The Magic Mountain and wishing he had some kind of muscle rub because he's been walking in the woods. And I just think it's so hilarious that he's reading Thomas Mann for some reason. I don't know, maybe it's, there's something in the book. But that's like, okay, this is this means I have to read this book because he's reading The Magic Mountain. So maybe I will. We'll see how far I get with those two. So completely, uh, you know, this cozy book and then Luster from Le Leilani uh, are on the docket right now. And so I'm not exactly sure where that leaves me with Anna K AK. But you never know, maybe, Maybe I'll decide within, you know, it's one point sometime this week that I do want to get back into it and I will pick it up again. You never know. And so, yeah. Um, and I'm also listening to the second M M Amazon book, which is, is fine, but I do need to get a copy of it. So Dead House Gates and so much is happening. But, you know, I'm following along well enough that it holds my interest. So I will continue that too. 
and I think that's about it. Uh, I, my review of The Good Soldier was a little bit weak, I, I grant you that, but I did not care for it. Oh, one thing, one last thing, yeah, I'm just noticing it. So our narrator, I didn't talk about this before, one thing that kind of I thought was a little bit irritating is that he's supposed to be an American from Philadelphia, and Ford Maddox was British, but he did in the end end up in, in America, in Michigan of all places, teaching at a college of all things. I think it's a sign that he sort of came down in the world financially, at, at least. But but so the so the fact and he and it goes on and on about him being a Quaker, and and so an example of what sort of irked me a little bit is that I never got a sense of his personality or, or his being an American. Being it just he just keeps saying that he's an American Quaker, but there's not not enough of. I don't see enough of his actions to sort of bring home his Americanness to me, as opposed to his Britishness. Or, I mean, his wife turns out to be a horrible person, wanted to go live in England. So the sort of English American thing, which I know James does a lot with, it didn't quite work for me either there, because he, to me, he just didn't. He seemed so colorless that I didn't really couldn't really place him or didn't care. He didn't seem American. He didn't seem British. He just seemed kind of a cipher almost. And an annoying one at that. And with that, I'm going to leave every leave it uh, for this week. Hope everyone's doing well, and I will check in with you at the very latest next end of week Sunday. Hopefully not Monday. Uh, have you read any of these books? Are you into the cat mysteries? Have you ever read any Lillian Jackson Brown, Brown Brown books about Coco and Yum Yum? <laughs> and I will talk to you very soon. Bye bye.